Hi, yes, hello everyone, I'm Gavin.js and we need to talk about for loops. For loops have been the bane of my existence since I started seriously working in Blender and using geometry nodes about a year ago. I've been working on this video ever since then because for loops were an integral part of my workflow in Houdini and it seemed like we just didn't have any of that in Blender. There's still no way to write code directly in geometry nodes like we can in Shader Graph or in Houdini. And until 3.6 and 4.0, there was no way to loop at all other than to just copy and paste node groups ad infinitum, or so I thought. Since I started to learn geometry nodes, I've been trying to wrap my head around the odd, backwards, unintuitive logic that they use to figure out how to make a for loop, because according to the internet, you just can't do it. Not before Blender 4.0, and we'll get to that. As I was researching geometry nodes and trying desperately to understand how they work, I would constantly go back and forth between researching for loops and trying to take small snippets of tutorials and all sorts of little things to make the same functionality that I wanted from a for loop. And eventually, I figured out what was going on. Because yes, every version of Blender since version 2.92 where they introduced geometry nodes has had for loops just not in the way you'd think. So after that lengthy intro, I'm going to go over what I consider the necessary parts to make a for loop, nodes we need in order to make for loops, the new zones that we have available to us, and finally an example of all of these things put together. So what is a for loop? Or really just a loop? For anyone who's unfamiliar, it's just where we have some instruction and a list of values that we want to execute that instruction for each value or for x amount of time. Also there are multiple kinds of loops but they're all functionally the same so I'm just going to say for loops and they have three main things that make up their utility in my opinion. We need to be able to set the number of iterations or times to run over the loop either as a constant or as some parameter. We need to be able to read and or change values based on the current iteration and we need to be able to accumulate values per iteration. These are the criteria that make sense to me, so how do we do this without writing code or using a set of loop nodes? And the answer is fields. Fields are functions in geometry nodes, which is why it's easy to not directly associate them with loops. Here are a number of functions that return all sorts of data, and this is not an exhaustive list. But the ones that I use most often are the index, position, id, and normal nodes. Each of these nodes loop over each of your points, edges, faces, whatever category of elements, and returns the defined data about each element. The key thing about all of these nodes is that they have this diamond socket. There are three socket shapes, and they tell you what sort of information that node can input or output. A circle socket can accept a single real value and not a field, and will only output a single real value. A diamond socket can accept and output a field, but they can also accept and output single values. And the diamond socket with a dot is just a visual identifier for when it can accept and output a field, but currently it's only working on a single value. So with all of this in mind, a node with diamond inputs and outputs is called a function node, and like the nodes I mentioned before, this includes loops, but can be any function. So this satisfies the first criteria that we have for a for loop because we can use comparison nodes and boolean math to select any element and read that data. Then we can manipulate that data and store it in a variable or attribute per element. And all of that put together gets us most of the functionality we're looking for. But there are more nodes that can enable so much more, and I like to call them sample nodes. Essentially, these nodes enable us to loop over different pieces of geometry, transfer attributes, transform geometry based on whatever, all kinds of things. And they all work together to add more functionality and better refine what information we're looping over and operating on. Then the last thing we need in order to have all of the functionality of a for loop is to accumulate values. I put off making this video for so long because I didn't know about the accumulate fields node. This node allows you to define groups and then total up some value within that group. Once I realized we had this in geometry nodes, I realized we have everything we need to make for loops. It's just that all of this functionality has been so tied up with functions 
is become kind of buried and difficult to understand until you really understand everything about geometry nodes. So of course, everybody online is just saying, no, you don't have for loops. When really you do, there's just a lot more to it than that. And of course, all of this was before Blender 3.6 and 4.0, where we got simulation zones and repeat zones respectively. Obviously, these are both huge, but they come with their own caveats. Simulation nodes are awesome for physics and doing things over time, but aren't exactly an answer to the question of, can we make a node group and loop over that X number of times? But then we got repeat zones and everything is changing. Then there's one more thing I want to talk about with the repeat zone, and this is directed specifically at new Blender users, or at least new geometry node users. If I had had repeat zones when I first started using Blender, it very much would have dissuaded me from researching the underlying ways that geometry nodes works. I don't think I would have researched function nodes nearly as much as I have trying to figure out for loops. And I know I definitely would have just had a million repeat zones everywhere. And there's a large chance I still will here in the future, but hopefully not as much now that I know how the functions are supposed to work in geometry nodes. So to mitigate all of this, I'm thinking about making my own series where I go through each and every node and talk about the functionality and different use cases for each one. Let me know in the comments if you think that would be interesting. And to wrap all of this up, let's take a look at this project that I've been working on where I'm recreating Conway's Game of Life, which uses all of the things we've talked about. Fields, sampling, simulation, and repeat zones. And while I think I could have done it without repeat zones, it was a lot easier to wrap my head around with them. So overall, I'm very excited for the addition of repeat zones. I'll be making a follow-up video where I do a bit of a deep dive slash tutorial on how I made this and some of my big takeaways. So if that's interesting to you, definitely hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified for when that comes out. Or if it's the future and it's already out, it'll be up there in the corner. So the key thing with Game of Life is that we have a grid of cells and each cell needs to be aware of the state of the eight cells around it. If a cell is on, we call it alive, and if not, we say that it's dead. Based on that, we have a few rules to determine the state of the current cell for the next frame. If a cell is alive and it has two or three living neighbors, it remains alive. If a cell is dead and has exactly three living neighbors, it becomes alive. Otherwise, it either dies or remains dead. These are the simplified rules, so if you want more of an explanation, check out the Wikipedia for more information. I've left the link in the description. So we need to loop through each cell, find and loop through the eight cells surrounding it, sample them to measure each cell's state, total up the number of alive cells, and finally check that number against our rules to determine the value of our cell for the next frame. All in all, a lot of looping to get this to work. So to begin, we create an arbitrarily sized grid, convert that to points, and give each point a random value of 0 or 1, and store that as our initial alive variable. Then we're going to want this to play over time, so we need a simulation zone. We also know that we need to take a look at each point individually per frame. So we need a repeat zone inside of the simulation zone. We'll use the total number of points as the number of iterations, and we need to know which iteration we're on to look at the right point. To do this, we create a new input value set to zero and run it all the way to the output node with an add node that just adds one to the value per iteration. After that, we need some way to find the eight surrounding points. So instead of doing some complicated math to find the indices, what we can do is find the distance between each point and the current point. Then we can just compare the distance to some minimal distance that we know will contain all eight of our points. Because I want all of this to be procedural, I can't just use a constant here, so instead we'll compute the distance between index 0 and 1, since we know that they will be right next to each other. And then we can multiply that by the square root of 2 and add a small buffer just to really make sure that we get all of the points we're looking for. Then we also check that the index isn't equal to our current point, since we only want to consider the eight surrounding points. So if the distance between any given point and our current point is less than the variable we just found, then we can separate those points. And if the remaining points are alive, we'll separate them again 
and use a domain size node to find the number of points remaining. Initially, I tried to use the accumulate fields node to try and total up the number of alive points, but this just wasn't quite the application that that node was meant for, and it led to more headaches than solutions. So once we have the number of alive points around our current point, we can take that value and run it through our Boolean logic. I'm not going to explain this mess here since it's not exactly germane to what we're talking about. So again, I'll explain all of this in the video on Conway's Game of Life. After we know if our point should be alive or dead in the next frame, we store that value on the alive variable so it doesn't mess up the calculations for the other points on the current frame. Then we can just transfer that value to the initial alive variable after the repeat zone, but before we leave the simulation zone, so we can do it all again for the next frame. Then after all of that looping, we can just delete all of the dead cells or instance whatever kind of geometry to our alive cells, change the material, whatever you wanna to do to visually distinguish the living and dead cells. And one more thing that's just a bit of a stylistic choice, I added a condition where we only run the repeat zone every nth frame so that it runs a bit slower and there's time to look at the pattern that was generated on this frame. And that's it! There's a lot going on and again I'm sure I could have done this without the repeat zone, but it made everything a lot easier to understand and gave really good examples of every type of loop we can do and some of the different functions that we have access to in Blender 4.0. So with all of that, this has been quite the ride and I kid you not, I've written this script five or six times because I just, I kept learning new things of how Blender works and then new updates came out with new features and new zones and, uh, but in the end, I hope you have enjoyed and learned something new and helpful, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.